Telecast. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to another Telecast. Now, unless you've been living under a rock these past few months, you'll know that artificial intelligence is set to revolutionize the way we live and work. And rather than focusing on the negative assumptions that AI is going to take all our jobs and destroy the world in some dystopian future, I thought this week we'd look at the practical applications of AI right now in the content industry. So what are the tools that can change the way we work, improve efficiency, create new ideas, help you sell your shows and save your money? This week, I'm speaking with Jason Mitchell, founder of The Connected Set, Ben Ritchie, Chief Technology Officer at Slate IQ, and Dr. Seppi Chakave, Departmental Lecturer in Data Science at Oxford University and CEO and founder of PixelUp. First up is Jason Mitchell. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us this week. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Not at all. Well, there's lots of talk about AI right now in just about every industry and especially the TV industry. And we're talking this week about AI tools for TV producers and content industry producers. And you've kindly put together a top 10 list of tools available right now for TV producers to go and use and check out. Are these in any particular order, Jason? Do you know what? Let's run down from 10 to 1. So you'll have to listen all the way to the end for the one I'm the most excited about. How about that? Okay. Before we run through these, does one need any sort of prompt training or coding knowledge or any sort of specialist background or ability to actually utilize these tools? Definitely not. Um, I mean, everything we've selected here is stuff you can get your hands on straight away that's relatively inexpensive, that doesn't require any coding knowledge, that, you know, just you can use trial and error to play with it and see what results you get. So definitely um, applicable to pretty much anyone working in the industry. Let's get started then. Number 10, what are we going for to kick things off? Well, I thought for 10, we should start with the obvious one. It's a brilliant tool. It's ChatGPT. And I'd be amazed if people haven't heard of this particular tool. And it's the thing that obviously brought AI into the mainstream. But it's got to go on the top 10 list. You know, it's basically a chatbot that you can find at chat.openai.com. And what you can do is essentially ask it any kind of question in text, and it will answer you in text. Every answer it'll give you is unique to the question you ask. So it's not like a search engine. It's more of a kind of human-like interaction. So, you know, just to give a couple of examples, let's say I wanted to come up with some ideas for BBC One. I could ask it to generate five ideas for me. I could feed it in a brief, and it would come up with five completely unique ideas. And then I could ask it for titles and then I could ask it to write me a sizzle script or select some footage or music. And then I could get it to write the email for the commissioner even and maybe make it feel personal to them. So it's obviously it's not perfect, but it gets you 75 percent of the way there. um, And it just kind of speeds everything up. It's kind of like a co-pilot for the tasks that you'd be doing anyway. It's just a really user friendly tool that anyone can use. It's free of charge. You can get a subscription if you want to use a slightly more advanced version of it that you know is kind of always has good uptime it's a really great tool there's equivalents as well like bing uh, google is building something called bard chat gpt is the og so uh, you've got to check it out and it's free of charge as well and it saves you time and hopefully gets you to a point of making more incisive pitches and pitch documents and moves things along very quickly that's good Although, Justin, I just wanted to say, actually, you do have to be careful of hallucinations, which is sometimes it will just make stuff up. So you do have to fact check. And also what's interesting about it is most of the data it's built on stopped at the year 2021. So actually, some of the stuff that's happened in the last couple of years, it might not know about. So proceed with caution. But generally, it's pretty good. All right. Okay. So use this as to do the bit of the grunt work. But, you know, you certainly need a a human to fine-tune the result before you send it off anywhere. For sure. What are we going with for number nine? Okay, number nine is called Gamma. So this is a tool to create decks, and it does it so quickly. It's the kind of quality of deck that a designer might have spent a day or two days working on that it can create in you know a matter of minutes. The website is gamma, with two Ms, dot app, A-P-P, 
And again, this uses prompts, text prompts, a bit like ChatGPT. You would ask it, for example, create a deck for a new dating show set in amongst nature. And what it will do is generate you three different designs. So one might be a forest theme or one might be a beach theme or one a river theme. And then you select the one you want and then you can refine it. So you'd say, oh, make it a bit more Caribbean, less Mediterranean or, you know, change the primary colors or make it a bit more naturalistic rather than abstract. And then even within the specific slides of your deck, you could say, oh, actually, could you present this information as bullet points instead of prose or could you make a table for this? So it's just a really fast way of creating slick looking decks. Um, It's free to use although the free version does have a watermark on it so if you really want to look professional it's between 10 and 20 dollars a month and you can do it without the watermark presumably the prompt function on this is is absolutely key like you say you can hone and hone and hone and you know i've seen people when they're using mid journey and some of the other image generators out there there are specific terms that they use lens types or Wes Anderson color palettes or whatever. Yeah. This is the sort of thing that you can use to actually hone it to get exactly what you want. Yeah. So for example, this particular application might not know exactly how the, the brand identity of a channel, let's say E4. So what you might want to do in your prompting is say, these are the brand values of E4. This is how the brand looks. This is how the brand feels. And then ask it to generate your deck. And so you're giving it the information to help it create the ideal image or slides. Um, so that, that's what's meant by prompting really is, you know, how you're training the application to kind of hone the output for you. Let's move on to uh, number eight then. So I feel like you've been reading my mind mentioning Midjourney, and that is a really amazing um, application. But I'm actually going to um, talk about a slightly more user-friendly version of Midjourney, which actually you brought to my attention, Justin. So credit to you. It's called Imagine AI. And we've kind of heard about generative AI and, and you know, this is basically that for images. So, you know, it can create art, it can create drawings, graphics, photorealistic images. Um, but the good thing about Imagine AI is it's quite user-friendly. So whereas Midjourney, you have to do your prompting in, in a Discord server, Imagine AI is more like, you know, you've got some text prompts, but also then you've got little toggles. You know, you could adjust color palettes or dimensions or the type of lens. And like Midjourney, it will give you multiple images that you can select from and refine. And, you know, to give an example of how we've used this um, at the Connected set, you know, we were doing some filming with Prince William a few months ago. And as you can probably understand, the palace really were quite insistent on knowing exactly how the shot would look how it would be lit and what would be the background and because prince william is a public figure you know this particular tool could not only create a photorealistic version of him but could then create the background behind him to show to the client exactly how we'd want it lit the lens choice we'd have so it's a really useful tool actually for pitching or kind of expressing a mood board creating a, something for a deck Is there a cost associated with that one? You can do a a few free images, but generally it's a bit more expensive. It's around, I think, $7 a week for this one. So it is quite a lot because it's using up quite a lot of server power to create these images. So so that's kind of what you're paying for. Um, You can find it at imagine.art. And just to let everybody know, we're actually going to include the links to all of these tools in the episode description. So you can uh, check on there and uh, click through and and have a look at Imagine AI. Just saying on that one, you're right, Midjourney was the one that was blowing everybody's mind about six months ago. You know, having to have a Discord account and connecting that all felt a little bit codey, didn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it's it wasn't really the user friendly version that Imagine AI is. So yeah, Absolutely. I'm sure that that's something that people are going to adopt that a li- little bit easier. Okay, number seven. We've obviously just talked about images. Now we're going to talk about video. This is called Runway. It's the second generation of this particular service, and um, I think the web address is runwayml.com. And actually, I just got back from a conference in Germany and everyone was talking about this. So essentially, it's another prompting tool where you can type in what you want. But instead of creating still images, it will create you a moving image. So 
let's say I said I was making a taster tape and I said, I want to see the camera slowly zooming through a woodland towards a man sitting beside a tree looking at the stars. What it would do is to actually generate that video for me. And and essentially, it's it's kind of stitching together lots of still images. So, you know, it's not the smoothest video, like it's not like shooting it yourself, but it's a really good way of giving a sense of how a scene might look. So I would definitely put it in a taster tape, for example. And and it's only going to get better and better. That's the thing. Like we're so early in this AI journey, but give it a year, 18 months, I wouldn't be surprised if this is like recreating the kind of footage we can, you know, we have to go out and film at the moment. Yeah. And this is so much better for visualizing again at a pitch stage, I guess, or even sharing your idea with talent or just communicating your ideas in a video medium that is really super cost effective and quick to produce. Definitely. And, you know, it would be quite an incredible tool for animators as well in the future when actually you can just describe the scene you want and it will render out an animation for you. So pretty interesting and potentially quite disruptive stuff. And how much is Runway? There's various plans. You can do it um, a free version as well. This one charges more based on the number of seconds of video you make. It works out around five US cents per second. So the longer the video, the more it costs, because again, it's using lots of cloud computing power. So that's why they charge that way. Using Runway, can you refine your style as you're working through it and develop it in the same way that Imagine AI does? Definitely, yes. That's that's a, that's the whole point of it, really. So, yeah, you'll see that first render, and you can then just say, "Oh, actually, you know, let's make the stars a bit brighter, or whatever, whatever you need." So, number six. Cool. So, this is called Pictory. The web address is pictory.ai. This does a lot, but I'm just going to focus on one aspect that I think is really applicable to people working in television. Going back to the days when I would do like casting of contributors for Wife Swap and things like that you'd get off these casting calls and you'd have like an hour's worth of footage and your boss would say, oh, can you just cut it down to one minute for me? And this is the tool that basically makes what used to take you a couple of hours take about 10 minutes. So what you do is you upload the video that you've just recorded of your contributor to Pictory and it will just automatically transcribe it for you using voice recognition. You know, it's pretty good and you know, 95% accurate. And then it will output for you a transcript in what just looks like a Word doc, really, or a Google doc. But the really smart bit is essentially you just go through and select the bits you want to keep, the bits you want to lose. You can drag and drop and move text around. And then essentially it will just render it through to the video. So it will just create that one minute casting tape in a matter of minutes. If I were in casting now, I would be like, this is the best tool. You know, it just frees up so much time. All right. Okay. So that's a casting specific type tool. And what's the cost for Pictory? I think it's around $20 a month and you can do a free trial. You can, I think, make up to three videos. So it's worth just having a play with it anyway. Um, You know, and you could use it as well, possibly for things like, um, you know, if you've done a master interview and you want to, again, do maybe a rough edit. I, I believe it also integrates with kind of standard editing software so you can export an XML. There's lots of uses, but for me, like casting is the killer application. You know, it seems to me all these five so far that we've talked about, you know, there's loads of opportunity just to go in there and for a very limited amount and maybe even use trial deals and all the rest of it. You can actually get your hands on these and and play with them for practically nothing, can't you? Absolutely. Like, you know, give block a day in your diary if you can, and you could play with all of these in a day and probably get pretty good at, you know, all 10. No point sitting around moaning about no commissioning going on. It's like spend your time looking at AI tools and and hopefully some of these will uh, create sparks of inspiration that will be uh, there for when the commissioners get back again. Okay, we're into the top five. So next is Capwing. And this is a way of creating videos really quickly for social media. So what you do is it's a platform where you feed in a script. So for example, you might take a LinkedIn post you did And then what Capwing does is it looks for free stock footage that kind of matches the text. Now, I wouldn't recommend this for like a broadcast program, but if you wanted to do like a quick and dirty kind of social media post that, you know, was better than just having voice, but it kind of brought it to life with pictures, this is a great tool for that. But you can output that video, share it to your socials, 
and publish it on you know whichever platform you want and also i should say the libraries that it's using i looked into it this morning actually apparently they are royalty free reputable trusted libraries so you should hopefully be able to have confidence as well that it's not stealing content just randomly from the web and how would you use capwing in a normal sort of production sense Again, going back to casting, you know, these days, often we're casting on places like TikTok and Instagram, and you'd often create a casting video to attract people to apply for a show. But what if you had a quick way of creating multiple versions of a video that were very customized to the particular community you were reaching out to? So, you know, you might have a Bollywood version of your your casting video. You might have another version that's for contemporary dancers. And, you know, so it's just a quick way of creating multiple videos using stock footage. And what's the cost of Capwing? It is $16 a month. And I should say, actually, these prices are constantly changing. It's interesting. Like you look one day and it's going up and it's going down. But right now, if you try it this week, $16 a month. Number four, Jason. So I am a massive like Google fanboy and everything at the connected set that we do, we run on Google Workspace. But what I'm about to talk about does also apply to uh, Microsoft Teams. They have their own version. So this is called Google Duet AI. And this is the Google's big AI integration with the Google Workspace. It's quite expensive, actually, and you do have to pay for this one. It's around $30 per person. And I believe you do have to have a business account with Google. So it may not be something that necessarily, if you've just got a personal Gmail, you can use right now, although I'm sure they will roll it out soon. It's taking their AI models and applying it to all of the things you do in Google productivity tools. So, you know, for example, uh, and, you know, this is something that regularly happens to all of us. You're in a meeting, a video call, a colleague comes in 15 minutes late. And you have to do that annoying thing of bringing them up to speed. Well, imagine you came into a meeting and rather than having to ask your colleagues to update you, you could just type, give me five bullet points summary of the conversation so far. And Google, it's AI, which has been listening to your conversation, will output the key bullet points. So you can just bring yourself up to speed. Or then imagine at the end of that video call, you said, can you just email out a summary to everyone of the call, but also put in the action points um, that we discussed and who it's allocated to. And, and Google will pick all that out from the speech in that conversation. Then, you know, I might have to write up a deck. I've been allocated that task. So again, a bit like the Gamma tool, I might be able to ask Google to co-pilot making a deck with me and then drafting the emails and maybe even like making it very personal to the commissioning editor by reading my Google emails and working out that they've got kids and asking them how their kids are, which is kind of creepy. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to kind of speed up that, I suppose, somewhat monotonous stuff that you often have to do and just give you more time to do the fun stuff, which I think is a general message of AI. A lot of people, you know, who are concerned about it, I see it as a tool to free you up to actually do the things that you enjoy rather than having to, you know, write minutes from meetings and things like that. You just mentioned something that, that's interesting, actually, uh, Jason, when you think about Google and, you know, some of the huge technology businesses that are, are moving into this space and have been involved in this space for, for a number of years, you would imagine that there are elements of quite a few of these services that they perhaps already offer. So you say Google Duet would probably be able to do the same job that Gamma would be and and probably, and certainly through Bard, it might also be able to do what Chat GPT can do as well or certain elements of it. So it's probably worth looking into the Googles and the Microsofts and seeing what they offer for business customers. Yeah, I mean, they're the kind of, I suppose they're going to be the super apps of the future in terms of AI. And a lot of these smaller services that are out there at the moment quite possibly will either go out of business or Google, Microsoft, etc. will take them over and integrate them into their tools. You know, don't forget that Google have been using AI for years. Like, I don't know whether you've ever noticed when you write an email, if you're a Gmail user, it often will suggest the next sentence and that you should write and you just click the tab button and it puts it in. So, you know, that's all AI. It's just now making these tools a lot more powerful and, and integrating it with all of their products. So Google Duet AI, you say it's about $30, $30 a month? $30 per user at the moment. Um, I don't think there's a free trial, sadly. Well, actually, I think there might be. I think you can get a free trial for up to three people in your organization for like a week. Yeah, for most people, it's $30. There might be three or four 
use cases for some of the previous services we've used that might be incorporated in that. So it actually might be more cost effective. What have we got at, uh, at number three, Jason? Okay, so this is called Autopod. And this is a post-production tool. Basically, it integrates with Premiere Pro and there's loads it can do, but I'm just going to highlight one aspect. And this tool is all about speeding up the editing process. So the way I see it as being really useful and some of the stuff we do is let's say you've just done a five camera studio shoot and you can ingest the rushes into this tool. And essentially you go through and you select which microphone corresponds to which camera. Um, And, you know, if you, for example, you have a wide shot that might have two microphones feeding in, you can select that as well. And then you essentially click a button within Premiere. um, And this is a tool that integrates to Premiere, as I said. And then in what's actually faster than real time, it listens through your rushes, analyzes who is talking when, and then creates an edit automatically switching between the shots of who's talking. But not only that, when there's silence, it will intuitively do things like cutting to a wide it's a really fast way of getting that initial edit, you know, and again, you'll, you'll want to fine tune it. For example, you know, if you were filming your podcasts, it would just be a way of kind of creating that video output almost instantaneously. And when it comes to using the interface for Autopod, is that the same as uh, Descript and some of the other services out there where it just looks like a Word document and you can actually edit out words in a Word document and it, it'll edit the uh, the video to coincide with that? To the best of my knowledge, it's not actually. It's more of a kind of a plugin within Premiere. So I don't believe there's a, t- a text editing functionality in it, although I'm sure someone will correct me in the uh, in the show notes or on LinkedIn. But yes, so you do need a little bit of knowledge of Premiere, I guess, with this one. But Premiere is one of the easier editing tools. So if you know the basics, you should be able to use this one. Autopod. Now, that I mean, that sounds like a lot of people will be using that. What's the sort of cost of Autopod? So you can do a free trial for 30 days and then it's $29 per month. To find the details, it's on autopod.fm. We're up to the uh, the top two. What's at number two, Jason? I am like an inner geek and I really love basically project planning tools. This may not be other people's number two, but this is definitely mine. It's a tool called Tom's Planner, and it's an AI extension to Tom's Planner. Basically, it's a project planning tool that we've been using in our company for quite a long time, where you can create project schedules and Gantt charts. So production managers and project managers love it. But they've added this AI extension, which is in a kind of beta phase, but is pretty cool. So what you can do is you can set up a new project and you just put in a short description of your project. And then the planner will create this ready to use end to end project plan. So as an example, let's say you're making a cooking show in a TV studio and you ask it, create me a plan of all of the protocols around how we should store and prepare food. And it will just pull inspiration from the web and essentially build you that plan step by step. Or, you know, if you needed to build a set, it could create a plan for that. Or even for you, Justin, and the digital content forum conference that you're running, it could probably help you uh, with a bit of the planning for that as well. So it's really great for planning out projects, but it's also iterative. So let's say I see the plan and I say, oh, I wish it were a bit more environmentally sustainable, what it's suggested. I can then with text say, make it more environmentally sustainable and it will do that for me. It's just great at getting you started on project planning, sorting projects into nice bite-sized chunks, basically. What person within the production process would you see as using this as a key tool? Definitely production managers, 100%. Maybe people more around, you know, set building, maybe even pulling together a casting strategy or, you know, pulling together a series of protocols around casting. But mostly it's a production management tool. And, you know, I often feel like the production managers get left out in these discussions because we all like to talk about, you know, mid-journey and all the kind of fun, creative, image-based stuff. But actually, this is something for the PMs to make their lives easier. And we know filming is a pretty logistics-heavy process and anything that can help that organisation, that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. And how much is uh, Tom's Planner? It's around $10 a month, um, which is really good. And I think you can create up to 20 projects for that. Okay, the time's here, Jason. Number one, what is number one in your AI tools for TV producers? 
I love this because it is super scary, but amazing. It's called Play HT, and it is a voice cloning technology. And we use this at the connected set for voiceovers. It doesn't replace fully the person that you know comes in and records in a VO booth, but we have to create quite a lot of fast turnaround content that we publish on Snapchat that is very topical. And we have um, a kind of voice of our shows but this voice of our shows also works on productions and sometimes she's out filming. What this tool allows you to do is to take a real person, someone on your team who's given their consent, and essentially they read out a bunch of words for one minute, recording it onto the Play HT website. And it's all kinds of combinations of sounds that you'd expect to hear in natural speech. And then once they've done that, basically the tool can replicate their voice for any words Um, You know, words that you've obviously not said in the sample and output a VO record for you. And so then when you next log in, you can upload a script and it will generate the voiceover. And it is sounds scarily accurate like the person. I mean, I'd say it's 95 percent there. And it's it's really hard sometimes to tell that it's an A.I. So, you know, if, if, if I were David Attenborough's agent, I would definitely be getting his voice recorded on this and then licensing it for a very high price to wildlife dock makers in the decades ahead. It's, it's a super cool tool and it's definitely worth playing with. Play HT. You know what? I'm going to try it after we've chatted, Jason, and, and, and <laughs> people can incorporate that into this episode. Why not? Let's uh, let's see how it works with my dulcet northern tones. Yeah, you can, it can read us out. See if anyone can spot the difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And Play HT, how much is that? So it's free for one voice. It can output up to, I think, about 2,000 words. And then after that, it's about $39 a month. And you can clone up to 15 voices for that. And obviously, you need consent. It's very careful on the consent. So you can't just upload Tom Cruise's voice. But yeah, that's about the price. And the other thing, I didn't put this in my list, but obviously there's lots of really interesting tools now emerging that can also translate voices into foreign languages. So you could do your record in English and then it could have you voice it in French or Spanish. Um, They're a little bit more ropey now. I wouldn't say they're there, but that's coming down the line as well. So lots of exciting stuff in the kind of VO space. Well, we're going to be speaking to Seppi from Pixel Chat and Pixel R later on in the show. So I know she's got certain developments in that space as well that'll be interesting for us to discover. It's going to be changing, isn't it? It seems like these tools are coming to market every couple of weeks. So I'm sure the same list will be very different. Maybe we can do this again in six months and see uh, see how the list has changed. That would be great. I mean, we, we did um, an internal presentation of these tools about three months ago. And it is amazing how much it's changed in even three months. So once you get into this stuff, though, you, you'll become kind of hooked on it. So, but yes, I'd be very happy to come back. Brilliant. Thank you, Jason. And finally, I know that you're doing a uh, webinar on LinkedIn, aren't you, that covers even more products and services within this space. Tell us about that. Yeah, we're doing a half hour LinkedIn live video webinar. It's completely free. It's just a little something we wanted to do for the freelance community because we know obviously lots of people are you know not working at the moment and uh, really keen to upskill in this space there's a one o'clock on monday next week and we'll be running through these tools plus some more and we'll be doing demonstrations as well so we'll be bringing all the stuff i said today to live with videos as well that's the 25th of september at one o'clock uk time i guess all you have to do is go into linkedin and search for jason mitchell and you'll be able to uh tune in and i'm assuming jason it will be available for catch up as well on your linkedin page you can either search for me or search for the connected set which is my company and it will be around on the connected set uh, linkedin thereafter until it's completely irrelevant and we need to replace it all right yeah which will be uh, about two weeks time and uh, i know this could be a full-time job for me (laughs) jason thanks so much really enjoyed your chat really valuable getting that rundown of those top 10 tools and if anybody's got any comments and any other ideas suggestions again use linkedin to let us know and, and maybe we can feature some of these other new tools as we go on in future episodes thanks a lot jason thank you justin My next guest on this week's AI Tools special show is Ben Ritchie, who's Chief Technology Officer at Slate IQ. Ben, welcome to Telecast. Thanks for having me, Justin. Not at all. Great to have you on the show and great to be able to talk about a slightly 
different type of AI driven tool for indies. Tell us about Slate IQ, what it does and what's the problem that it's seeking to solve. I've joined Noah Media Group last year, beginning of last year, after they secured $2.8 million in funding to solve the problem of a lack of transparency from the platforms in terms of how titles are performing. So we are entering a post box office world, I would say. Perhaps not everyone would agree with me, uh, but certainly the days in which the box office were the dominant feedback for people to understand performance and that, you know, the value of DVD sales, physical sales and um, potential TV viewings would be rooted in how well something did in cinemas are truly over. So the big challenge that people face is understanding how competitive titles have performed, comparable titles increasingly things are going straight to streaming now certainly in the documentary space there's a lot less cinematic release and so the, the sort of feedback loop is, is gone in terms of viewership and performance data because netflix and others aren't sharing it so our goal as a company as no media group has been to take control of our own destiny understand what the platforms are thinking when it comes to consumership and viewership and trying to bring that capability into a product that we can help other indies do the same with. He's trying to take the guesswork out of the commissioning strategy and essentially yeah. give yourself a better chance of success when you're at pitch stage by pitching the right platform. And I'm assuming we're talking about predominantly SVOD platforms here. Yeah, so we have metrics that give us a sense of demand across all platforms. So we're not limited to any particular technology or a streaming platform, as for a platform. But yeah, that's a great summary is that we're trying to get leverage in the pitch process and understand the buyer side and, and the data that they have that's going into their decision making. The only thing I'd add to that is we also have a content fund. We invest directly in films for our investors. And we so we're also evaluating titles through the lens of um, film investors as well as just for pitching well for all the indies that are listening to the show and the opportunity once the yes for platforms get back to commissioning like they should be doing but once they finally do get back to the table and start acquiring and commissioning content this is about you providing data to the indie which is based upon presumably a predicted performance as in how certain titles in that genre have performed on their platform previously is that right yeah i mean that, that was definitely the goal is to to get to a level where we can predict accurately the outcomes of any idea given as little as a log line but where we've landed so far has been more of a research tool that helps you understand the landscape that you're entering so it will summarize for you the viewer reactions sentiment the social media activities, the segments within that audience. So is it made up of groups of young people, old people? For example, a Pixar film may be commonly grandparents taking their grandchildren to the cinema. And so not just a single metric of, oh, they're middle-aged, but actually it's old people, young people, which averages out to middle-aged, right? So it's a bit more interesting when it's looked at through the view of different customer or audience segments. And yeah, we're trying to provide as much research as possible including the um, demand prediction or consumption prediction for each of the titles to help any filmmaker understand, okay, what's come before me? How well was it received? It's very easy to have a conversation with the platform and say, hey, look, I know you bought title X for $10 million, so I've got the next version of that for you. But actually, you know, that title may not have done well for them just because they spent $10 million on it doesn't mean it actually performed for them. So yeah, they, actually, they might be saying there's a last thing we want. Exactly, yes. Yeah, so you don't want to follow that one in. Dollar pitch, right? Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be uh, referencing things that perform badly. And so uh, as a research tool, we're looking to give you insights onto what the zeitgeist is, what the trends are. Perhaps you've got a, a title that's dealing with PTSD or some other topic. We can help you understand, is that a growth topic? Has it plateaued? What kinds of demographics might that appeal to? And concretely, which of the platforms have commissioned content similar to that. Is this Slate IQ 
product technology that Noah has been using before it was developed as a Slate IQ product. Can you talk to any successes that Noah might have had using this this AI driven tool? We already had a process through which we would evaluate titles. You know, our director of marketing and distribution came from Universal, had seen how the big studios operate, had brought that kind of a process to Noah and sort of formalized our process. But it was still requiring a lot of legwork to pull these reports together. And there was also insights that we couldn't get unless we had access to relatively expensive data sets, including, for example, piracy data, as well as social media data going back to 2006. So it was only once we got the investment in 2021, $2.8 million for State IQ, that we were able to take what was a very manual process with missing data and really complete the job of making this pipeline which we built it's so expensive to run such a pipeline and and to have a data team that we realized we would quite like to bring this to market and share the costs with other indies and share the benefit essentially a strength in numbers type argument that as indies we collectively are stronger if we have this information and if we subsidize each other's use of it so that's where Slate IQ came from as a brand and why we're doing it. Noah's had a lot of success recently with a lot of their sports stocks. That's a, a relatively good recommendation of success. So essentially, you're positioning yourself as almost like a, an external data science team yeah. there for indies. We've looked at Netflix and Amazon and lots of the other streamers and Disney, and they're obviously they never like to share the data that they have, whereas producers that are producing directly onto YouTube and some of the other AVOL platforms have, have got all of that data and that's really helping them hone their products for their consumers. So we've seen Nielsen coming to the market with a product that claims to be able to track the performance of Netflix and, and other SVOD platforms. How does Slate IQ generate the data? It's a great reference point to to, to call in Nielsen. Obviously, the Media Ratings Council removed their accreditation because they undercounted the Super Bowl viewership. And that subsequently led to private equity investors buying out Nielsen as an entity. So there's there's certainly a lot of disruption and challenges in the traditional consumer panel type approach for viewership measurement. So historically, Nielsen, Barb, et cetera, would have panel, maybe 10,000, 20,000 people who would press a special remote control to tell people what channel they're watching. The challenge has been with the explosion of content available across all these streaming platforms and the lack of synchronicity around people all watching a certain channel at a certain time, 20,000 people is not enough really to accurately understand multi-device usership, right? So people people are second screening, they've got their phone, they're on their computers, their laptops, they've got smart TV, Everyone's struggling right now to keep on top of this. So everything's panel based. There's always all these different panels that exist, you know, that, that are using different tricks and techniques, but there's no one complete view on consumption. And to answer your question, how are we doing things at Slate IQ? We're similar to Parrot Analytics, which is well known for leveraging piracy data as a dominant source of demand, as well as social media data. So we're taking a similar approach to them. But, you know, we're retailing at like a tenth of the price. So we think Parrot's out of league, out of reach for a lot of indies. But Slate IQ is priced at a level that can work for most of the sort of UK indie community. And to be clear, the reason that we trust piracy data as a way of like understanding demand, we we call it a, a proxy measure The reason we think piracy is a good proxy for real consumption is we did a significant study into the hours viewed of content on Netflix. So they published a top 10 rankings table with the hours viewed. We correlated that data against the number of piracy events across a six-month period and found a 90% correlation between piracy and published Netflix top 10 hours viewed. So we're very confident in that as a measure of um, demand. So this show is about AI. We haven't talked about AI. We've talked about solution, which is probably the right thing, right? Um, <laughs> talking about the product and solution. How is AI integrated into this? Is it just a case of AI 
looking at the data and delivering you the right insights based upon huge data sets? Is it just the speed and the intelligence of the system that's been uh, applied? Yeah, so it's interesting because, I mean, the evolution of AI has gone from being an inflation of machine learning. So people using the term AI to sound a bit grander than what is really just machine learning. And below machine learning is just good old fashioned statistics, right? So a lot of machine learning, modeling, whatever you want to call it, neural network efforts have over the last 10 years have been in the world of modeling numbers and handling numeric prediction, for example. That's kind of where we started from. It's like, okay, how do we understand what's high level of consumption or low level of consumption? What are the common themes? around conversations online, for example. But then obviously generative AI has blown up over the last year or so. We started to integrate that into the pipeline. You described this as a sort of data science team for indies. I think that's a good characterization. Is certainly the way I think about it is a leveling up of the sell side of us, the indies, who sell into these massive corporations that definitely do have data teams and sort of demystifying what they may be seeing. And yeah, certainly we've with this new generative AI stuff, which can understand text, video, imagery, and also can communicate well to humans now. We're using that to summarize the reports, to pull out the key interesting insights, to give in these useful talking points without assuming that they have data science level skills. So this is good. So this is democratizing the data and basically leveling the playing field and allowing you really to make smarter decisions and smarter pitches. I guess everybody out there is thinking, how much does this cost? You know, I mean, it sounds brilliant. We probably all agreed that the days of licking your fingers, sticking up in the air in terms of whether a show is a good idea or a bad idea or relying on a mate in commissioning to help you out or do you a favour. I think those days are probably gone. How does the indie make these smarter decisions? What does it cost? We've gone out to market last year, middle of last year, with our early adopters at $1,000 a report. But what we've seen is that people have slates of ideas. They'd like to evaluate the whole slate. And they're having to sort of cherry pick a single idea that gets to a certain level of maturity in commissioning where they feel that that's justified. And part of the reason why the price points have to be so high has been because we've had such a manual process of delivering the insights. So we've been operating as a consulting service, essentially. But what generative AI has enabled us to do is to automate that consultation and deliver reports that are meaningful without that human intervention, that high touch delivery. And so that's letting us explore lower price points now with uh, early adopters. So um, definitely recommend people to reach out to us to explore, self-serve with us, and we can offer a much lower price than the per report price, but at a subscription, which gives unlimited reporting. So it's uh, pretty exciting times at Slate IQ HQ, but uh, definitely recommend people reach out if they, if they feel like a subscription could be right for them. Who would a subscription be right for? You know, who's the ideal Slate IQ client out there? Is it a medium-sized indie who's developing a new slate of titles or wanting to know what to pitch or how to pitch a particular project or what sort of project to actually develop? What will deliver maximum value for an indie using your service? Yeah, so we've had inbound requests from LA where there's a, a single first-time filmmaker who wants to make their first horror movie. They're reaching out to investors. They want to create a compelling pitch deck, and they've bought individual reports. But I, I think your initial characterization is sort of mid to high-level indies, let's say 10 employees and above, are probably the sweet spot for us at the moment where they can get repeated value from the system. They can understand how to get the best from it. They're executing multiple reports every week, every month to justify the cost. Well, everybody can take a look at the Slate IQ website, slateiq.com, and I'll put a link in the episode description so you can uh, have a look at the website from there. Ben, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Really interesting to hear 
tools and the way that these AI tools now are also helping in the development and the just taking a lot of the guesswork out and making science and data driven decisions. And that's now available to Indies as well as commissioners. Yeah, thank you, Justin. I mean, I think you found the key word in it all, which is democratization. I think that is absolutely our mission statement here. And I welcome anyone to reach out for a, for a conversation, commercial or otherwise, I'm really keen to democratize access to this type of insight. Thanks for your time, Ben. Thanks, Justin. So my next guest on this week's AI special show is Dr. Seppi Chekave from Pixelar. Seppi, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Justin. How are you? <laughs> I'm really well, and I'm really excited to be learning about all these new AI tools and the uh, opportunities and possibilities that they afford TV producers, both now and, and also in the future. You're Oxford University departmental lecturer yeah. on data science, and you've got a really long and distinguished career within developing data sets and AI driven applications that solve real world problems i'm really interested in hearing about pixel chat mm -hmm. which the opportunity or the possibility for it is kind of mind-blowing for me in terms of democratizing tv around the world so tell me a little bit about pixel chat and what that is uh, thank you justin pixel chat is the next generation of data communication with embedded translation in over 100 languages. What does that mean really in uh, simple terms is, if you think about our mobile phones, as we use them now, they're capable of doing hundreds of wonderful things and our life is totally dependent on them. But uh, if you take these mobile phones and compare them to the first phones which were invented at the end of the 19th century, is that they've got one common deficiency. This common deficiency is that if you want to communicate with somebody over the distance, you have to have a common language. So if you ring somebody in Japan, you either have to speak Japanese or English or some other common language. This is the problem I have solved. So you can communicate with anybody across the world without knowing their language. In fact, you can do it in 100 different languages, in text, voice, and uh, synthesized voice. So Pixel Chat is, uh, I have been working on it for the last six years. We created uh, the first version of Pixel Chat peer to peer for mobile networks for 5G digital catapult networks in the UK. We tested it already in March, early 2020. Now we were thinking about how we're going to develop that further. We, we tested it between uh, UK and Singapore. And it is interesting because um, if you think about things like streaming technology and in particular uh, high bandwidth for mobile like 5G or 6G, actually streaming is a bit of a whitewash because for the nature of streaming, you always have got this buffering. This buffering is to do with the compression and how you would fit it to the de device and it would always be there. So even if you have got a very, very fast network and you're watching something streamed, there's always be a delay and the buffering causing part of that. But the real true fast networks, especially in a mobile communication, is when you have got a direct interaction with someone. What does that mean is if you're speaking to somebody, you expect that that person speaks back to you immediately. And that is why Pixel Chat is so appropriate for... Um, mobile network. Going back to 2020, then um, when we developed that, we tested it successfully between UK and Singapore. Then we were thinking about what we're going to do, and suddenly pandemic happened. And then technologies like uh, Zoom and uh, Teams, they all came about. I went back to the drawing board, and I uh, made Pixel Chat as a multi-user, multi-platform. And based on this engine, we created a number of products, which uh, these products obviously use for different areas. We've got Pixel Chat Lounge, which is this video communication platform. Then we've got Pixel Chat Live, which is for conferences, and we, it's been used as we speak. And we have got Pixel Chat Learn, which is for teaching and learning. And again, with my academic hat on, technologies like Teams and Zoom, they are not pedagogically evaluated. Whereas um, Pixel Chat Learn is something that is based on experience from uh, we have used. So coming to broadcasting, 
I think pixel chat can be used for things like live dubbing, transcription. We have also got a version of pixel chat, which we call iPixelR, and that is specifically for, um, uh, so if you have got a, uh, let's say, social media video, distributed across the world, let's say in Chinese, and you just watch it. Our technology, P Pixel Chat, can instantly extract the, um, create a transcript, and then it can immediately translate it in 100 languages. So in terms of the technology, and we'll come on to talk about TV in one second, but I'm recording on a Zoom recording device right now. You're Iranian. Mm -hmm. If you were speaking in your uh, native language, you'd be speaking in Iranian to me, but actually the technology exists, you've developed the technology that actually you would be speaking on the output of the recording in English, but it's still in your voice, your synthesized voice, but in English. Absolutely. That is where we are developing these uh, synthesized voice as a add-on to the uh, existing part of Pixel Chat. I can speak any language, or let's put it this way, people can hear me in their own language. I still speak my own language in Farsi, but everybody else would hear it in their own language. So in terms of the opportunity for the TV industry, mm -hmm. for producers, for distribution companies, is they shoot a show or a series in their own language, but it can actually be viewed in over 100 languages but the actor's or the voiceover or the presenter's voice is actually in their own voice, but synthesized to be in 100 different languages. So wherever you're watching it in the world, it eradicates the need for dubbing, essentially. That's right. I mean, it, it clones your voice. Let's say if you have got f film or movie or something like that, like EastEnders, all of these cast, they would be able to sort of clone their voices so people in China they would hear or watch the, um, the um, this episode in Chinese but the actors are speaking in Chinese language with their own voices it's fascinating and a huge opportunity for you know creating breakout hits even more so than they are now it's really knocking down those barriers for international distribution in in many ways the question I've had is there's hundred languages every language has got its own certain peculiarities sure. for example and if you think about that in English but you know I only speak English and really pigeon two or three other languages but but you know when you're speaking for example in Italian you know the the way native Italian speaks is the way of speaking as well as purely the language is is very very different to any other language so how is the technology representing that and how does that work? Well actually Pixel Chat is an end-to-end -end product and then is also component based. The translation uh, that we are using, we can use uh, our own translation or we can use anybody else's translation. And uh, the advancement which has been done through this neural network is now possible to make these translation, machine translations, relatively accurate. So I was told that 80% of world population speaks 28 languages. And the machine translation for these 28 languages for something like Pixel Chess is over 95%. For example, in Persian, we have created our own text-to-speech engine. There was no tool which would allow uh, you could hear things in Persian. I, because I am Iranian, I, I created this uh, for, for Pixel Chat. So effectively, what does that means is that you can have all these languages uh, where people... Um, are very small communities. They can not only exchange their own culture, they can also receive the culture in their own language. And that is really taking over the barriers of, uh, of language. To tell you the truth, Justin, the motivation for me was because if you think about social media, what is social media? You see, we as human beings, we live in this analog world and then uh, we discovered this digital universe. So the gateway between the analog world and digital uh, world is through what we call portals. So when you create yourself a, a sort of like a Facebook page, for example, that's your gate to create your what we call as a social machine. This becomes your social machine in digital world. And when these social machines are connecting, then you get the social network. Uh, but what is interesting is that up to now, the social network 
independent on which which country it's always been just a singular language so you interact with your friends in english somebody interacts with their friends in uh, japanese someone in italian but this is not what the uh, what the social machines can do the social machine can do millions of languages they can so this was really the way to to make these social machines multi modal universal so it's, yeah, yeah it would make it them universal yeah. yes so make actually make the most of the social media by activating these uh, possibility of uh, multilingual for the social machines that is really the scientific background behind that and then finally so for our tv industry audience that listens to the show this is a software that you've developed so where will we see this being utilized in the coming years and i know you're in conversations with lots of different companies which you obviously can't tell us about but how I mean, it, how will this be be utilized i mean the whole thing is that because pixel chat is software and it's multi platform it means it can work in any any device already so i think it's really about the creating the um, the need for the user and how the if the products are developed let's say by the manufacturers let's say they take for example a smart tv and a, st- a smart tv of the future would be um, something that is very personalized and um, again i'm I-, I think the tvs are very very important they never would be um, completely um, removed because that is culturally for us, it's the center of our family, is where people gather and things like that. But what is becoming is becoming more into a, a socially um, acceptable. I mean, the boundaries between your mobile phone and te- uh, TV would uh, would disappear as this is disappearing. So they become much more the content. I mean, if you are watching something now like uh, Netflix or um, uh, things like that, they become very personalized. I mean, let, let alone the language. But I mean, they try to, uh, or even with Amazon, you know, they push in uh, the um, the sort of content which is based on your profile and things like that. So I think this is effectively Pixel Chat is. A tool which is enables the content producers to have the possibility to make the um, the the narrative and their story and the content multilingual and uh, this can be put into a future smart TVs in a much more seamless way or it can already be used by content producers as a tool that they would put in I personally think the beauty of pixel chat is because it primarily focuses on a live content. I mean, it is, of course, we can do recorded as well. And recorded, there are so many different tools available or will be that they do post-production. But you see the strength, somebody told me the strength of broadcasters are is only with the live content. Because if you have got the permission to sort of like broadcast the, uh, um, I don't know, World Cup, you are the one that you, I mean, everybody else would be then copying it and put it up. But it is, it is that advantage. And then that is the advantage that now the broadcasters would have to yeah. have a tool like that. Immediately when you're talking about that, uh, any broadcaster that uh, signs up the rights for a particular live sporting event costs millions, obviously, to acquire that. But it costs millions more to actually stage their own production. But what you're saying is that there could be one central commentator, for example, on a live sporting event, but that could actually be in real time translated in the commentator's voice to a hundred different languages in I mean, real time. Just take, for example, something like Olympics. I mean, you, you don't see the commentators. You only hear them. It doesn't matter which language. I mean, can you imagine that having Olympics? In Olympics, every country which has got is, um, or something like, maybe I'm, I'm getting now a bit, or something like Eurovision, for example. Uh, you know, it, it's um, your popular the presenter. In this case, um, uh, is Graham... Um, Graham Norton. Norton. Yes. I mean, he can he can give the, the rights, for example, that... Or if um, Terry Wogan, um, uh, late Terry Wogan, was alive, you know, would, would, would that be possible now to create these uh, future based on his uh, his? Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, you know, then it offers the opportunity for the rights holders to actually broadcast themselves and to actually eradicate other 
international broadcasters and be the central hub broadcaster yes. because translation is taken care of in real time. Wow. Okay, that's that's really, really <laughs> fascinating. The, my mind's bubbling with possibilities here. Seppi, thank you so much for joining me. It's been much, fascinating. It's and been uh, good luck with everything. I'm sure we're going to see uh, your product in the headlines in the months and years ahead. Thank you so much, Justin. It's a pleasure. Well, that's about it for this week's telecast. In case you're wondering, this is a cloned version of Justin's voice. What do you think? I don't think I do a Yorkshire accent very well, to be honest. If you've got any other suggestions for artificial intelligence tools for content production, let us know on social media. Just a quick note to let you know that early bird ticket offer for the Telecast Digital Content Forum in November expires on 31st October. So buy now before prices rise. This week's show was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. We'll be back with another show, same time, same place next week, but it'll be the real Justin. Until then, stay safe, 